Last week, the Salt Lake Tribune released an article that I thought made really good material to explain how the media operates in undermining the church and pushing the social justice agenda. The author of this article is Peggy Fletcher Stack, who has no problem using her massive platform to attack the church. Now, this particular attack is a witch hunt against Mormon bishops. And what better way to attack Mormon bishops than to have an actual Mormon bishop on your side? The article references a certain Mormon bishop several times, and after doing some research, I found this particular bishop's Twitter account. His name is Richard Osler, but goes by the name Papa Osler. Apparently, he used to be a bishop of 300 young single adults. Turns out, he's an SJW, who holds himself up as a mentor for young single Mormons, even though he's no longer in the bishop capacity. One scroll through his Twitter and you'll find a man who loves to bask in the praise of the world as tweet after tweet is nothing but a continuous line of virtue signaling and regurgitating SJW platitudes while using a strange amount of emojis. He calls himself an LGBTQ ally and is pro-feminism, pro-Black Lives Matter, and is strangely preoccupied with the idea that at least one of the three Nephites is gay. Now, going back to this article, I wanted to share with you the stages of this particular SJW attack. The first step is to identify a problem. The problem in this article is that the bishop's interviews are inappropriate when discussing the law of chastity and moral cleanliness. The article states, This generally happens in two ways. First is when the Mormon lay leader of a congregation, usually the bishop and always a male, calls in the boys and girls of his flock from ages 12 on up for an annual interview to ask about their testimonies, church attendance, faithfulness to the LDS health code, and adherence to the law of chastity. Some bishops pose pointed questions about moral cleanliness in these conversations, perhaps quizzing about masturbation, heavy petting, or fornication, while others keep their queries more general. The other type of interview is when penitent members go to their bishops to confess actions the church deems to be serious sins. This exchange may also delve into details of intimate sexual behavior. Now, she does reference an LDS spokesman who states, The leaders are counseled to not be unnecessarily probing or invasive in their questions, but should allow a young person to share their experiences, struggles, and feelings, he says, and to adapt the discussion to the understanding of the individual and to exercise care not to encourage curiosity or experimentation. But then the article follows up the statement with this. Even with these instructions, the system at best is fraught with an inherent power differential, adult to youth, authority to follower, male to female, and can be uncomfortable and present risk for both parties. The next stage is to level an accusation of misconduct. The accusation being made here is that young Mormons are being harassed by their bishops. The article states, An online petition with more than 6,000 signatures urges the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to immediately cease the practice of subjecting children, ages 10 to 17, to questions about masturbation, orgasm, ejaculation, sexual positions, or anything else of a sexual nature. Notice the language here. They say that they are subjecting children. Subjecting insinuates a forceful action. And most people don't think of teenagers when they hear the word children. I think the words being used here are quite manipulative. Now the thing about this accusation is how do you determine if this is something that is widespread and serious enough to be addressed? Now I know SJWs love to share their anecdotal experiences. However, I don't trust SJWs. They don't have a track record of being honest when it comes to pushing their narratives. For example, recently American Renaissance released an interactive map, which I will leave a link to, that tracks hate crime hoaxes from the past two years, which shows that they are actually a big problem for SJWs. Since America isn't racist, sexist, and homophobic enough to fit their narrative, they have to stage fake hate crimes to push their agenda. I'm sharing this with you to show the level SJWs are willing to stoop to in order to push their narratives. The SJWs in the church have an agenda, which is to undermine the credibility of bishops by accusing them of abusing their positions of leadership. What's stopping SJWs from concocting stories and hoaxes like the ones we see in the media that reinforce and validate their narrative? Now, I'm not saying misconduct doesn't happen, but I'm highly suspicious of any accusation made by an SJW, especially over something that fits their agenda, and especially if it's something that's difficult to verify. Now, I also want to point out that this petition also is intended to publicly shame and humiliate the church. The reason this is important is because SJWs love to shame. It's probably one of their most effective tools when dealing with members of the church.
The next step is to make a demand. What is the demand? Well, along with discontinuing the practice, they want a public disavowal. If the church ever did disavow, it would only serve to validate this dubious accusation. It would also be taken as an admission of guilt. The church has nothing to gain by disavowing. The final step is to offer their solution. What is their solution? This is where the author draws from the opinions of Mormon therapists, who also happen to be SJWs. Mormon therapist Julie Hanks says that it would be a positive step if youth could have another person in the room, a parent, for example. Mormon therapist Jennifer Finlayson Fife wonders why the church couldn't just give responsibility to the female leaders or, if we want to keep it with the bishop, at least have a woman present. So we have two Mormon SJW therapists suggesting a third party be present in the bishop interview. The third Mormon SJW therapist, Lisa Tinsmeyer Hansen, takes it to a whole new level when she says, Few of the 30,000 LDS bishops worldwide have any understanding about how spirituality and sexuality are entwined. She continues, They could use a lot more training from people who have studied these issues. And according to the article, that is precisely what Richard Osler did not long after he was tapped to be a Mormon bishop. So the question is, did Papa Osler become an SJW before or after he was trained? I believe that the agenda behind this hit piece is to justify launching a campaign for SJWs to inject themselves into the member-bishop relationship. Ultimately, I believe they are trying to position themselves to function as a replacement to the bishop and the church. Notice the language she uses when describing the bishop. He's just a lay member of the congregation. He's not a professional. Plus, he's a man. He might get turned on by hearing the details of sexual sins committed by the young female members of the ward. Everything about this article was to undermine the credibility of our bishops and generate mistrust in the system itself. Something I want to draw attention to is just how many of these Mormon SJWs are therapists, a good chunk of which are sex therapists. So then, when you're dealing with a temptation or a sin that is sexual in nature, do you go to your bishop? or to a Mormon sex therapist. I'm not saying that there's no place in the world for the therapy professions, but we are currently living in a society that is increasingly using therapy to replace religion. Many of these SJWs believe their fancy degrees make them better qualified to play bishop, which is why they seek to undermine the credibility of bishops in the minds of Mormons. That way they can justify their involvement in the member-bishop relationship, either by requiring the presence of a therapist at bishop's interviews and or requiring bishops to undergo special training by therapists. Now I know some people who do work in the therapy business who do a lot of great things for people, but based on what they've told me and based on what I've seen myself, the therapy industry has largely been co-opted by SJWs. This is a problem because in the ideology of social justice, telling people to put off the natural man is considered harmful and oppressive. That kind of thinking is the last thing I want to be present when my kid is participating in something as sacred as the repentance process. As far as the bishops are concerned, I believe they would do well to learn about SJWs and how they operate so they can best protect themselves. The sad reality is that SJWs are willing to stoop pretty low if it gives them leverage to push their narratives. Something that has helped me to understand SJWs and how they operate is a book called SJWs Always Lie by Vox Day. You can buy it on your Kindle for six bucks. It's a pretty easy read and it will help you when dealing with SJWs. It will especially help you if you are in any kind of leadership capacity, whether you're a bishop, stake president, or even higher in the leadership role, because you will be mostly targeted by SJWs. So I think that's where I'm going to end this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments, like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.